Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. Hey, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here, and I am honored to serve under our senior pastor, Marcus and Natalie Avalos. They're actually taking a much-deserved weekend off. We had a wild week here at the church. Really challenging week, but man, God, his grace just flowed through everything, and our pastors were Man, our past, you know what? We have some of the most caring pastors, and I don't just say this because I've been hanging out in the church for 46 years. They're literally some of the most caring people I've ever met. When it comes to pastoral care, they are absolutely incredible. So we're grateful to have them uh, as our pastors. We're going to continue our series. Actually, this is the last today in our installment in the book of Proverbs, where we have been talking about living with wisdom. Before we start into that, though, I just want to remind you guys, this is the last weekend to sign up for our men's event Next weekend, we have a men's event. We're doing it different this year. Normally, we pack up our stuff and go stay at a camp over in Wimberley. This year, we decided we all want to sleep in our own beds at night. So we're going to actually have the event here on Friday night, and then we'll have another event Saturday morning. So the idea that you don't like to leave your family behind is no excuse this time. You get to come here Friday night and Saturday. We're going to talk about some things that are very specific challenges men face. And listen, men... We need strong men in our world right now. Really, culture and society rises and falls on strong men. And when I say strength, what I'm talking about is what Jesus calls meekness. Meekness isn't weakness. They sound the same, but meekness is strength under control. Meekness is having a sword and knowing how to slaughter somebody if you need to, but keeping it sheathed until the appropriate time. And when you've got that kind of strength, but you know when to use it, that is when society rises and everyone benefits from strong men. I'm not talking about toxic men. I'm talking about strong men. So we're going to be talking about what strong, what really strong men really look like. And don't worry, I always get nervous going to these men's events because sometimes they ask you to do weird stuff. They're like, we want you to sit in a circle and tell us all of your worst things and cry a lot. And we won't do that to you. Okay, I promise. It won't be anything like that. So don't worry. This is the last week to sign up. You can sign up in the back or on the app. We would love to have you there for that. All right, y'all ready to jump into this? Thank you for that thunderous response. <laughs> All right. So a few years ago, I got it in my head. You know, I write books, right? And they say that if you're going to be a good writer, you've got to be a good reader. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to read 100 books a year. And I actually pulled it off for about three years, and then I just, then we had a kid, and that's impossible. So, uh, I started reading these books, and you know, when you read that many books, they're kind of just like, they all kind of blur together, and you're like, did I read that in this or that? Well, there's this one book that really stood out to me. It was called The Geography of Bliss. I found it at Half Price Books. Also, when you read that many books, you got to find the books for really cheap, right? So I was walking through Half Price Books, found this book for $2, and it was talking about happiness around the world and what, how people around the world define happiness and what countries are the happiest and what countries are the least happy. And what stood out to me is in the book, he said, the least happy country in the world is a country called Moldova, which is in Eastern Europe. And he, he tried to figure out why is Moldova the least happy country in the world? And what he discovered is nobody in Moldova trusts anybody. They don't trust the government. They don't trust their friends. They don't trust their family. Like that's hard when you don't even trust family because if you don't trust your family, who you got? There's no trust. And he says, basically, for healthy relationships in a society and in an individual family, there has to be a level of trust. You have to believe that the person standing across from you is going to try and do the best they can for everybody involved. And you're going to try and do the best you can for everybody involved. And you're not going to intentionally lie to them. You're going to try and tell them the truth as best as you can. And you have to have this level of trust. And Malcolm Gladwell, in another one of his books, he talks about this idea that society functions on what's called a default to trust net like thing, where we, we immediately assume the people that are running things, the people in charge, they have some trustworthiness to them. And if that falls apart and nobody trusts anyone, the whole country falls apart. And I got to thinking about me, about the fact that if I'm honest about it, there's like one person I trust, maybe two. One's my wife, but the one I trust, the person I trust the most is me. I don't trust a lot of people. In fact, I'll never forget, this was when I, I, when I was a very young kid. Uh, we were sitting in a Sunday school class, and my dad was the pastor of the church. I'm a pastor's kid. And uh, if you guys haven't figured that out, that's why I am the way I am. I'm a pastor's kid. 
And I remember asking the teacher this question because she had given this answer and she was just like, well, you just gotta, you know, just believe God. And I'm like, yeah, but what about this? And she got really mad at me and she gave this, but she gave this answer and I go, well, that's not a good answer. And she goes, go see your dad. So I, I got kicked out of Sunday school and I'm walking to go to my dad and I'm thinking in my mind, you know, I'm a little six-year-old kid. I'm thinking, that lady is teaching the Bible and she has no clue what she's doing. And, and here's what I've learned as I've gotten older, you guys. Listen, this may be a shock to you. The people in charge of the world have no clue what they're doing. Do you know how I know that? Because I run some things and I'm in charge of some things. I got no clue what I'm doing. Let's be honest. You know, I'm, I'm up here supposed to be teaching the Bible. The more I read the Bible, the more I'm like, this is the deepest, most profound truth in the entire universe I don't even understand one one millionth of it. And yet I'm up here and supposed to give you the truth from the Bible. And I'm reading it and I'm like, I don't even know how to do this in my own life. This is hard stuff. The fact is we're all kind of trying to figure out what we're doing. And the challenge is we want to trust each other, but we're all also kind of trying to figure out what to do. And what it consequently leads to is a lack of trust sometimes. And, you know, as I work in a lot of psychology and counseling. And what I've found is how you approach anything in your life is how you'll approach everything. The view, the lenses that you use to view the world and any situation you're facing, they're pretty consistent in how you f face anything. So how you approach your marriage in some ways is going to be how you approach your job, is how you're going to approach your relationship with your kids. And the crazy thing is how you approach your human relationships oftentimes projects on how you approach God. And that's a real problem for me because this is the honest truth. I want to trust God but a lot of times I don't. And if we were to talk for a few minutes, here's what I know about everybody in this room. I believe that because you're here this morning, you would say, yeah, I want to trust God. Mm, but I want to trust God that he's going to provide for all my needs. But man, I remember growing up poor. I remember not having the stuff we needed. I remember I couldn't get the shoes that all the cool kids got. I remember with me and my family, we were poor. And back in that day, I don't know how they do school lunches anymore, but it used to be like on a sliding scale where some people would pay this amount, some people pay this amount, and some people pay this amount. I would always go through the lunch line last so that nobody saw that I got discounted lunch. And all of my rich friends, they paid the full price for lunch. But I was so ashamed of that. And I know some of you, you grew up really poor and you say, you vowed, I'm never gonna let that happen again. So you're like, yeah, I trust God. But when it comes to money... I don't know. I kind of feel like you let me down in the past, so I'm going to make sure I take care of myself. And you write it off as being responsible, but the fact is, it's maybe a lack of trust in your life. Some of you, you say, man, I want to trust God, but I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that he would heal her, and she still died. And we had people tell us, you know, we saw a dream, and she's healed. She's going to be healed, so keep praying. And then you believed and you put everything into belief and you still lost that person you loved. We've all got areas of our life because of past experiences. Some of us, we say, I want to trust God. But the honest truth is if I tell people that I work with that I trust God, they're going to be like, oh, you trust some big invisible guy up in the sky. <laughs> we want to trust God, but most of us, we don't. And there's certain reasons we don't and you have your reasons. But I want to talk this morning about how to truly fully and completely trust God with your life. Because that's what King Solomon says in today's verse. In fact, today's verse, I think literally is the whole Bible summed up into one Bible verse. It's from Proverbs 3. And if you, we've been talking about King Solomon's wisdom. And wisdom is simply understanding principles of how, the life, how life works. Principles, they say, if you do this, you'll get this. If you don't do this, you'll get this. And so principles are flexible, right? You say, okay, I, I, I know what the principle is. If I do this, I'm going to end up with this. And sometimes, for example, one of the principles is the borrower is slave to the lender. There's nothing in the Bible that says debt is sin, but just know if you get into debt, you're going to be a slave to the people that lent you the money. And you know that because they've been calling you like, hey, you got to pay me back, man. That's a principle. And one of the principles we're going to look at today, I think this is actually the core principle, is something King Solomon says in Proverbs 3. He starts off and he says this, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. 
Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. And he says this. He says, oops, wrong button. Sorry. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. And fear just means have a healthy respect for who God is. It doesn't mean walk, worry around. he's going to be walking around with a baseball bat to beat you down. If you're in Christ, there's therefore no, not, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. He's saying if you do all this, it'll actually make you healthy and strong. And then he goes on and says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son, he delights in him. Now I want to jump back to what he says here because I think this verse here is the core of all of the Bible, really. And this is the verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now, right out the gate, this is a problem for me. Lean not on your own understanding. Do you know why it's a problem for me? Because I'm really smart. I'm also very humble. It's a joke, right? But really, I've read a lot of books. I went and got a master's degree. I've seen a lot of stuff. I've traveled in over 80-something countries. I've seen a lot of stuff. I understand how stuff works. The problem is I don't understand everything. And you have to make decisions in your life based on what you understand, but oftentimes we don't understand enough to make a correct decision. And I always trust myself most. And here's how this plays out. Yesterday, we had a major electrical problem on our property. And I called the electrician out and he told me what was wrong. And I didn't believe him. I said, that's not right. I know how electricity works. I was like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna call my friend Johnny. So I called my friend Johnny. He's a, he's a pastor at our church. I have to pastor, excuse me. He's a member at our church. He's been a member for a long time at our church. He sits right in the back there. And I called him. I said, Johnny, I got an electrical problem for you. And he goes, I said, I already got an electrician that told me what's up, but I don't believe him. And he's like, you, you didn't believe the electrician? I was like, well, he's only 35 and you're 70. I'm going to trust you more than him. Because here's the reality. Like, I'll trust a 70-year-old doctor over a 35-year-old doctor any day because they've seen a whole lot more stuff. A young doctor's going off of what they taught him in medical school, but you know that. Like, you, only, you learn so much stuff, and then you actually learn real life, and you go, well, there's all these other th variables. So I asked him, I said, this and this and that, and he goes, well, it's probably this. And I go, oh, that's what the other plumber said. <laughs> and I was like, but that's impossible. He's like, well, it would be impossible, but it's not. Because water heaters do weird things and they create counter currents. And I'm like, what? I didn't know that. I learned something new yesterday. And it took an expert telling me that. But here's the challenge. Most of us, we're pretty convinced we've got what we need to operate in this world. And when things go bad, we start to go, how can I fix this? I can fix this. In fact, in psychology, we talk about something called locus of control. And locus of control is how much power you believe you have over a situation. And there's an external locus of control, which is you believe that you don't have any power over situations. The extreme of it would be a external locus of control is I believe that I'm, I don't have any power and to change any situation. I'm just kind of a victim of everything that happens to me. Internal locus of control is I have power to change things. And there's actually studies that have been shown that if you, if you see the world from an internal locus of control, you actually have better mental health. You'll live longer. There's all sorts of things that go well with it. But the reality is in any given situation, we have power over things. We have some ability to impact the outcome of things, which leads to the next part of this verse. It says, lean not on, an, on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit, which I don't like that word. Submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Listen, this is really important to understand. You can only submit if you have some power. If you don't have power, you can't submit. You're just a servant, a slave. God has actually given you power. He's given you free will, the ability to make some decisions. He's given you a smart mind to do some things, to make some choices because you're not helpless. But the reality is if you want it to go well in life, God says, don't trust the understanding you have. Ultimately, submit 
to him and give his power the control in your life. I, I kind of envision it like this. If you're going to submit, right? It's like we all have this throne in our lives and we're sitting on the throne. And we're going, ah, this is my life. I've got my kids, I've got my church, my finances, my family. Kind of be like, you're like trying to kind of manage here. I got my finances. I'm keeping this, keeping this ball going here. Got my kids over here, right? Kids are usually like this, like, uh, right? <laughs> You try, and, and you start to kind of juggle everything and everything's going good until it's not going good anymore. <laughs> and you lose it. And then we cry out to God, God, help me, help me. I need to get things back in my control. And he's like, actually, I'm going to let you hit rock bottom so that you realize you can't juggle everything and keep everything in control. What you need to do is you need to submit to him. And what that looks like is not only stopping the juggling, it looks like you getting off the throne and saying, God, go ahead and take your seat here. And by the way, here's my finances. Here's my kids. Here's my career. I'm going to trust you with those things. And if you want to let me have them, I'll do my best to care for them. But ultimately, you're the one ruling in my life. Remember, this is the kingdom of God, not the democracy of God. The kingdom means he's a king and it only works when he gets the authority. And then he may choose to give you some finances, but here's the thing we realize. It's all his. He just gave it to us to manage. And sometimes we start to get overwhelmed. We go, God, this was yours anyway. I'm going to trust you with that. Your kids, things get out of control. And what ends up happening is slowly but surely, what oftentimes we'll do is we'll start taking control again. And we'll go, okay, okay, okay. And then you start sitting down on the throne and you sneak back on the throne. You kind of try and bump, bump Jesus off. And he's just like, all right. And he steps aside until we screw it all up again. <laughs> he's like, are you going to submit your life to me and get off the throne of your life and let me rule it? Are you going to submit to me? And, and, and the challenge we face every day is this. We are pretty strong, most of us. Some of y'all are really smart. Some of y'all are super quick. Men, some of you guys, you go, man, I can juggle a whole lot. I got businesses and family and blah, blah, blah. I got big hands and maybe you think you even got big, but you know what? <laughs> you can only do so much. And God will often cause us to crash and uh, not cause us. He will allow us to crash and burn because he wants us to get to the end of ourselves and get off the throne of our life. And we're pretty strong. And sometimes it takes a long time for us to come to the end of ourselves, but he'll go, I need you to trust me. So I want to talk this morning about four specific things that are mentioned in this verse. There's lots of areas we need to submit our life to God, but there's four specific ones in this verse that I think he addresses that we need to submit and surrender to God. And the first one is this. He says, my son, don't forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. The first thing you need to surrender to God and submit to him is your future. You need to trust God with your future. And I'm not saying you shouldn't prepare. You should prepare. I was talking to a young lady the other day. She's in college, and she was just telling me how stressful it is. Everybody's like, the career field you're in is soon going to be replaced by AI, and you won't have any kind of an opportunity. And I was like, listen, people are always going to be needed because God made people, and people are the point of everything. And no matter how great AI may get, we'll always need people. So I was like, you learn what you need to learn and stay in your lane and trust God with your future. There's a guy named John Cavanaugh, and he, was, uh, he went to visit Mother Teresa, and he was stressing out about his, fu his future, some plans, some transitions he had to make. And Mother Teresa came to him, he got to meet her, and she said, what can I pray with you about, my son? And he said, man, I've got these major things ahead. I need clarity. Please pray for clarity. And Mother Teresa said, no, I won't pray for clarity. She said, you don't need clarity. You need trust. I'll pray that you trust God. And he said it was such a jolting moment for him. And I think that's the reality for most of us. We want clarity. But listen, if you had clarity about the future, you know what you'd do? Yep. Oh, I got this. I got this. I got this. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. You don't, when you got clarity, you don't need God. In fact, you don't need faith when you can see the path ahead. Faith is a function of it getting really, really dark and you can't see what's ahead. 
I don't think you actually can operate faith until you can't see what's ahead and you have to trust God that he, he's got your future no matter what. And the plans he has for you are better than the plans you could come up with for yourself. In fact, as my dad always says, God's plan for you is what you would want your plan to be if you knew all the details. But you don't. So that's why you can't trust your knowledge. You have to trust his knowledge and trust him. Trust him with your future. Here's what else he says. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Sometimes we have to trust God with our reputation. Actually, always have to trust God with our reputation. Some of you right now, you've got some decisions to make. And if you make this decision, it's the right decision. It's the moral, ethical thing to do. But you're going to take a lot of heat for doing it. And a lot of people are going to maybe rake your name through the mud because... You did the right thing, but it cost a lot of people a lot of money. I talked to a lot of businessmen in this situation. Listen to me. A lot of times doing the right thing is not beneficial for you in the short term. It actually makes life harder in the short term. But in the long term, you have to trust that God is the one who's going to make, he's going to protect your reputation. And ultimately on the other side of it, you may find that some men applaud you. We may not ever get that applause from men, but we're living for approval from God. We want to stand before him when him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did the right thing even when everybody was telling you you should do the wrong thing, but you did what I told you in your heart. You need to trust God with your reputation. Next, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Your vats will brim over with new wine. We need to honor the Lord and trust God with our finances. And this is a hard one because here's the dangerous and tricky thing about money. Money gives you the illusion of power. Money gives you the illusion of safety. Jesus, he talked a lot about money. And he, he never said money was bad. He said the love of money is the root of all evil. But what he did say is this. He said it's really hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say it's impossible, but he said it's really hard. And I often thought, why is it hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven? And here's what I've concluded. The two ways we're transformed in this life are through experiences of great love and experiences of great suffering. Those are the only thing that cause transformation within us. An experience of great love and great suffering, which if you think about it is what the cross was all in one example. An experience of great love and great suffering. And more often than not, it's great suffering that wakes us up and we start to go, God, I need you. And maybe we'll jump off the throne and drop back to our knees and go, God, help me. And he'll go, oh, you're gonna let me take the throne again? Okay, that's where I belong anyway. And he comes and sits down, and, 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 but it's through great suffering. There's a verse in, in Acts that it says, through much suffering, we enter the kingdom of God. And I, I don't like that verse. I wish it wasn't in there. But the reality is there's something about suffering. And let me explain something. There's unnecessary suffering that we create in our lives from going against God's wisdom and principles, just doing dumb stuff. Y'all, some, we all know what that's like. We're like, Shh. I knew that was dumb when I was doing it and I did it anyways, right? That's unnecessary suffering. But there's some suffering in life that just comes because we live in a broken world and God allows things to happen in our life. I don't think he causes them. I think we caused them because we'd mess things up. But he says, you know what? I'm gonna work through that to actually transform you into who you wanna be. And that's what I would call necessary suffering. But here's the thing about money. Money will buffer you from suffering. If you've got money, and your transmission blows up on your car and it's going to cost $3,800 to fix it. And you're like, ah, whatever, I'll throw money at the problem. Or there's a good chance your transmission will never blow up if you have money because you're always driving a new car. But for some of us, if the transmission goes out, we're, we're like, how am I going to make, how am I going to get to work? How am I going to pay the bills? And when you've got money, you can buffer yourself from that. But it also isolates you and separates you. And you start to lean more on your money than on God and and trusting in him. I was talking to somebody recently who lost a family member and she was saying, we spent millions trying to get him treatment. They, had, they were blessed to have a lot of money. And again, there's nothing wrong with having a lot of money. If God's given you the gift of making money, you go out there and make a ton of money for the kingdom, okay? That's what God's called you to do, do it. But you've got to make sure you don't begin to depend on that money over depending on trusting God. And she said, ultimately, we couldn't stop the disease and he died of the disease. And it's the crazy thing, even with money, Eventually, life happens, and there's some things you can't be buffered from. And we have to trust that even in that, God is transforming us. Which leads to this last one. My son, don't despise the Lord's discipline and don't resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father of the son he delights in. That suffering that we go through a lot of times is actually what God is using 
to prepare us for the great things that he has ahead. He's strengthening us through the challenges. It's like when you go to the gym and you wake up the next morning and you're in pain, you're like, oh, I didn't even know I had a muscle there. (laughs) You know what happened? It's because you tore that muscle and when it heals back, it's actually gonna heal back stronger and that's how you get stronger, which is why the apostle Paul could say something as crazy as this. He said, we rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces endurance Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. In another passage, he says, so we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day for this light and momentary affliction, the suffering you're going through right now, it says is preparing you for an eternal weight of glory, which is beyond all comparison. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not on the challenges, not on the suffering, but we fix our eyes on on what is unseen. Because what's what's seen is temporary. The suffering is temporary. But what it's creating in us, that's eternal. And that's the confidence we have. The Lord, man, he loves us. And so he's not going to, he loves us too much to let us stay the same. He's going to discipline us and he's going to use whatever it takes to get you to the point where you're constantly reminded, God, all this is yours finances, it's all yours. You can talk about tithing and you go, oh, well, I give 10% back to God. You give it back to God, it's all his anyway. Apart from him, you couldn't have the money. So you just say, God, thanks for letting me have the money and thanks for letting me use the 90%. This is all your money anyways. God, my kids, man, they're your kids. And you know what? You love them more than I do. Can you believe that? God loves your kids more than you do. And you say, these are your kids. I'm gonna do my best with them. And we give them all back to him. And we trust that through the discipline that suffering is building in us, we're becoming stronger, but it's, we're becoming stronger because we're giving him more and more authority in our life and over our life. And we're trusting him more and more believing that, man, I don't know what you're doing right now, God, but I'm going to trust you've got a good plan for me. And as long as you're the one ruling and reign over my life, you're a good father. And a good father knows how to give good gifts to his children. And we can have that confidence in him. So my prayer this week is that you would constantly be reminded, you want to try and take things in your control, try and take authority over things, do things in your own intelligence, your own smarts, use your own charm, your own ability to manipulate. Instead, say, God, I'm getting off the throne of my life. I got back up on there. I'm getting off the throne. I'm going to give you the throne, and I'm going to trust you to rule and reign over my life because you know what's best for me. And it's challenged. Paul says, we're living sacrifice. He says, present your body like a living sacrifice. You know, the sacrifice, he used to put a lamb on the altar and then kill it. The problem with the living sacrifice, it just keeps climbing off the altar, right? It's this idea you constantly have to put God right back in his place and you've got to stay in your place and trust that he is the one who's leading and guiding you. Y'all receive that? All right, let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. And I thank you, Lord, that you are accomplishing your purposes in us. So I pray that we would trust you with our lives, with our finances, with our reputations, with our futures. And we believe that that you have good plans for us and we have confidence in that. If you're here this morning, you've not given your life to Christ. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. When I say this prayer, uh, if you say it and you mean it in your whole heart, what's going to happen is God is going to come forgive you of your sins and he's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and set you up with him in the kingdom of eternity and light. It starts when you say this prayer. It's not a magic formula, but it's, it's a, an expression of how your heart feels. Let's all say this together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you back there under the do it again sign. One last thing. um, I send out a weekly email on Monday, super short email, just encouraging email to get to kind of encourage you for the week. I, two weeks ago, I realized a bunch of people had signed up for it and I had hit the wrong button and they weren't getting the email. (laughs) So eh, technology and me don't get along sometimes. So if you want to sign up for that, it's super easy. Um, just scan that QR code and then the page that pops up, put your email address in and hit submit and you'll be receiving an email from me every Monday morning. You guys can stand. I pray that you guys have an amazing week. Trust the Lord with whatever you're facing. He's got good plans for you. You're dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, 
come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>